So it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Keith Nelson back to Ottawa. Um, Keith, uh, following a PhD at Stanford, a PDF at UCLA, Keith joined the MIT faculty in 1982. He's now the Haslam Dewey Professor of Chemistry at MIT. So it sounds very impressive. Actually, I've known Keith for many years, uh, probably from an ultra-fast phenomena conference. I don't know where, but probably. We always went to these. Now he gets so busy, I don't know about you, but I don't always go some work now. Um, anyway, it's, uh, I've sort of followed his work over that time. So among his achievements, he's worked on uh, new spectroscopies for controlling uh, oscillations, acoustic waves, lattice vibrations, molecular vibrations, excitons and spins in solids. Uh, he's developed novel ways to look at phase transitions, solid state, chemical reactions, uh, liquid forming, uh, glass forming liquids, and things like that. But I think among many other things, he's really also a pioneer of terahertz spectroscopy, especially, at least in my recollection, of pushing it to high intensity. And probably you're gonna say something about that today. Yeah, nonlinear terahertz spectroscopy. So Keith has won uh, many awards, but let me just highlight one, because this year he won the Bowman Michelson Award and it was presented in March at the PIPCON uh, conference in Chicago, Illinois. And so it's great to welcome you back to Ottawa and catch up on terahertz. Great. Well, it's really just a pleasure to be here. Is this a, too loud? All right. Um, it, it really is a pleasure and an honor to be here on, it, at this symposium. And I'm going to talk about one of my favorite to topics incredibly dear to my heart, which is nonlinear terahertz spectroscopy. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is walk you through the different kinds of light matter, matter interactions that, that we exploit uh, between terahertz fields and different degrees of freedom. So I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about interactions with electrons and dipoles and spins. It's, uh, it's sad, but I'm, gonna eliminate, I'm not going to talk about terahertz driving of vibrational modes. Um, but before I start there, I just want to sort of maybe step back a little bit and, and talk about light matter interactions a little more generally because I think really a, a lot of what all of us are here to celebrate is, is the incredible wealth of ways in which light interacts with matter to produce new and interesting states of materials, some of which we've already heard about just before my talk and earlier on in the day as well. Um, and it just drives so much of the development of, of certainly the spectroscopy, but even the optics and the photonics, a big part of the whole motivation to push that forward. Of course, part of it is purely optics, but a big part of it is to exploit and discover new ways that light interacts with matter to produce interesting results. So I'm not going to walk you through all the sort of eye candy that I put up here, but I just want to just sort of give a very brief overview of the, the notion that what's What's become possible, and, and this, is, this is stuff from my work, but of course very much more broadly than that, are, are ways to gain access to nearly all of the different molecular and material degrees of freedom with light. Not always those that you just have allowed transitions that, that you sort of have an open invitation to. Of course, we anxious and you were perfectly happy to exploit that. Uh, but there are many more as well. And so here are just various kinds of examples where we excite acoustic waves and look at, look at acoustic and mechanical responses that could span many, many decades of frequencies to characterize things like viscoelastic behavior. But also, more and more possible is to drive degrees of freedom in a way that's selective and also hard. In, and in that way, to move materials far from equilibrium in ways that are still controlled enough that we're not just, a draw, you know, it's not laser everythingization of condensed matter, right, where, where everything happens because many, many different degrees of freedom are driven at the same time. Instead, with a considerable degree of control so that even though something may be moving quite far from equilibrium, we still have a realistic hope of understanding the dynamics. And that's really important if we want to look at things like collective change of structure and phase transitions, electronic structure, magnetic structure, and others, where interesting things happen naturally if we just allow phase transitions to occur. And, and the question is, can we gain access to those degrees of freedom optically, drive them, monitor what happens, maybe monitor what happens not just in the, in the, along the coordinates that we drive, but also along coupled degrees of freedom that also respond 
right? So that we can learn about the kinds of coupling between degrees of freedom that give rise to all sorts of instabilities and rearrangements, right? So anyway, so here are some things at looking at linear acoustic responses and then going all the way to shock. In this case, we focus light to a circle and have a focusing shock wave and are able to really look, look at, at, at very nonlinear sorts of dynamics. This is a case where we actually launch particles and watch, the, watch them penetrate and, and look at very, very nonlinear viscoelastic responses. Um, you know, this, these are some examples of electronic spectroscopy. I'll just mention this one. This is looking directly at a photo-induced phase transition. It's, it's above the optical damage threshold, but even though it is, we can still all in one shot record several hundred data points in time and understand the dynamics of the phase transition. This is bismuth that undergoes a photo-induced electronic and structural phase transition. We can watch that and, and get a good understanding of it, even though the optical excitation necessary to produce it mildly damages the crystal on a longer time scale. So all sorts of, of very nonlinear responses become possible. Here's an example. We're looking at Bose-Einstein condensation of exciton polaritons. This was demonstrated first about 10 years ago. And you, you get these, these beautiful mode patterns that form. We show that these truly are Bose-Einstein condensates. That is, you have two Bose-Einstein population dis energy distribution in the, the population. I'll actually circle back to Bose-Einstein condensation at the very end of the talk. This is involving exciton polaritons. That's admixtures of electronic excited states and electromagnetic fields. I'll briefly discuss that again at the very end with other kinds of excitations. So now let's go back. Oops. Let's go back to looking at our terahertz field interactions with matter. And I'm going to walk through some of the, the different interactions and, and, and along the way try to describe what motivates that and some of the interesting things that we've been able to see. So first, let's just talk about generating terahertz fields. This is something we worked on for quite a number of years. And, and in, in the way that we typically do it, we use a lithium niobate crystal, a standard nonlinear optical material. Um, and this has a number of interesting features. One is that because it's electro-optic, you can easily visualize the terahertz field propagating in it. So for example, here we've used a line of light cylindrically focused, and it's just exciting single cycle ripples that move back and forth, very much the way sound waves would happen if I did this at the surface of a pond. But that's traveling at light light speeds, not at sound speeds. And, we, and, and because it's an electro-optic material, that changes the refractive index, and I can visualize it with optical imaging. The way that's being produced, actually, is an interesting light matter interaction in its own right. That optical cylindrically focused beam of light, that pulse of light, is driving the lattice of vibrations. It's niobium plus five surrounded by oxygen minus two ions. There's a Raman active mode there. And the light is driving it through impulsive stimulated Raman scattering. It's exerting an impulse force that starts that vibrational motion going. Right? But it's also a very polar mode. So you have this unit cell and the next one and the next one, all of them oscillating in phase. It's a huge radiating dipole, so it emits. So, so that's why we get terahertz radiation out, because that very polar mode is coupled to terahertz electromagnetic radiation. And the true normal mode of the, of the material is not purely vibrational nor purely electromagnetic, but it's an admixture. These are phonon polariton waves at the terahertz frequencies. So if you ask, here's another image of them, if you ask what's different about these light and dark regions, well, there's an electromagnetic field where the electric field is pointing, let's say, up here and down here, and there's a magnetic field. But there's also a vibrational displacement where that niobium ion is displaced in one direction here and in one direction here. That is the mixed phonon polariton wave that is propagating through the crystal. Okay? And it would be the same if I brought in terahertz light from outside, of course, outside in free space, it's just pure electromagnetic wave. As it enters the crystal, it'll drive that vibration. Inside the material, it is going to be the mixed mode. OK, so here are some variations on that theme. When we want to drive large amplitudes to make big enough fields to do nonlinear work and nonlinear spectroscopy, we just come in with a succession of pulses. And you can see this getting bigger and bigger. And now it's free running. So we just hit it and hit it again. And again, it's not so different from what would happen acoustically if I did this and then kept following it along, amplifying it basically coherently 
uh, superposing with it as, it as it propagates, right? Turns out to be very easy to do that. We can further enhance the terahertz field using simple metamaterial structures. This is a dipole antenna. You can see what happens if I, with the wave, come in and interact with it. It's going to drive the electrons in it and shake them back and forth, and they'll emit that this very nice antenna mode. Right? If we do the same thing with a somewhat narrower structure, narrow antenna, it's right here. You're going to see right here, right in that little gap, you're going to see that it's, that's the brightest place and it's out of phase with the driving field. That enhances the terahertz field, which in free space might be about one megavolt per centimeter, and in there can be tens of megavolts per centimeter. And we can put that right onto a sample, so that, that allows us to drive the sample even harder than we could drive it with free space focused radiation. This is something similar with imaging, except it's a thin, about 50 micron thick waveguide. By the way, one terahertz in air is 300 microns. Lithium nibates are pretty high, is a ferroelectric material with a pretty high dielectric constant. So its refractive index at terahertz is about five. So one terahertz in lithium nibate is about 60 microns, still pretty long. So here's the same thing, that same line excitation. But because it's a waveguide, you're going to see it's not going to stay single cycle. The different frequency components are going to separate. Also, there are several separate modes, and you'll see them propagate separately too. They're going to now find each other and recombine. You'll see the, the fringe pattern of interfering is going to be long first, and then it's going to get shorter and shorter, because the short wavelength components travel slower than the long wavelength components. From that one movie, we can, we can collapse. We, of course, this is redundant in the vertical direction. So we can take a line and then take the next time after that and make another line, another one, and make a time space plot. So this, this basically encapsulates all of the images that we just saw. And this is time and position. And if we Fourier transform in both dimensions, we have frequency versus wave vector. And this is the dispersion relations for three of the waveguide modes right, that came out of that, well, that um, one set of images. And there are all sorts of structures that are straightforward to make because, again, the wavelength scale is fairly large here. So this is just with femtosecond laser machining. We made arrays of holes that produce band gap structures. Right? Here is a cavity. We left, a, left out one of the holes. So now there's a defect that acts as a resonant cavity. At room temperature, it has a Q of about 70 or so at low temperature. It can go up actually at almost 1,000. So, so this is just some examples of how we make and manipulate these terahertz fields. In, in routine use, the way we make large amplitudes is what I illustrated. We come and keep coming with light again and again and again and again and building up a big amplitude and then couple it out of a crystal. Right? And there are various ways to do that. The simplest one really is an echelon. It's just a stair-step structure. A pulse of light comes and hits, and now you've got a bunch of separate lines of light that are differently delayed, just like on that video that I showed you. It's easy to make non... The, it, the sort of default output is a single cycle pulse. But it's easy to take light that has m modulations or just a series of light pulses and make multiple cycle terahertz waveforms or just shaped waveforms of various sorts too. So here are a bunch of multi-cycle waveforms and so forth. These are all out of lithium niobate, and the bandwidth out of that goes up to two or three terahertz. But nowadays, there are also a set of organic nonlinear crystals that can produce strong terahertz fields going all the way up to 10 terahertz and beyond. These are actually much stronger in field because as the frequency gets higher, you can focus them tighter and it's shorter in duration, the peak is higher. So this has tens of uh, megavolts per centimeter just in air. Right? Also strong magnetic fields, by the way, tens of, tera of Tesla. Here are just some more examples of these metamaterial structures that can be used to, to um, enhance the field strength. So I showed you this dipole antenna where there's this enhancement in the middle of it. Um, we often use split ring resonators like this. This is basically an LC circuit, so it has a resonance somewhere. And in these capacitive gaps, that's where you get the field enhancement. And similarly, structures with, you know, that are circular like this will produce a magnetic field enhancement because, of course, the, there'll be inductive coupling to the magnetic field. OK, so now let's talk about using these to interact with matter, and let's start with electrons. And in the simplest interaction, what do you do? You accelerate carriers, right? Electrons are very light. Terahertz fields can ac accelerate them to quite high energies. In ordinary semiconductors, for example, it's absolutely straightforward to accelerate carriers to multi-EEV energies, right? 
so you can substantially energize them, and many things will happen there, including things like impact ionization. It's also possible to simply pull electrons out of shallow or sometimes not so shallow traps or, or, or bound states and liberate them. So in many cases, they'll be liberated and then accelerated. So let's just see a few examples. Here is some early data that we took. This is just pump probe, Terex pump, Terex probe, and just ordinary bulk semiconductors. And all that's happening is we're accelerating carriers. We're producing a couple of EV energies. But up at those high energies, they have very, very much lower mobilities than at the ground state. And so with lower mobilities, we can't drive them very hard anymore. They just don't want to go anywhere. So they stop absorbing terahertz light. So the terahertz absorption, which is pretty strong to begin with, this is before the pump pulse came in, it goes almost to zero. Here's, so, so, so there's an enormous decline um, in absorption. And then there's recovery as the hot carriers cool. Right? Now, in some cases, that'll still happen. This is, this is indium antimonide. It has a very low band gap. So we've, we've energized all these carriers. And, and again, the absorption is dramatically reduced. Then it recovers, but it more than recovers. That's because all these hot carriers crash into valence electrons and liberate those, put them those up into the conduction band as the hot carriers relax. So each hot carrier can make many new conduction electrons. So at the end, you have more absorption than you started with because there's simply more carriers than there were. Right? And eventually, of course, this will go back to the beginning, but, but for a, long t a moderate amount of time, there'll be many more carriers than there were in the the um, tariff's response is, um, is quite a bit bigger. Here's an extreme example of that. So now it's gallium arsenide. It's not even a particularly narrow band gap. But we put one of these, these resonant structures on it. It has a resonance at about 0.8 terahertz. And now we've just turned up the field. And what happens? This resonance gets spoiled as we pump it hard. And that's because it's only a split ring resonator if there's a capacitive gap there. It's not supposed to be a good conductor. And it isn't a good conductor until we hit it hard with terahertz fields. And, and what's happening here through, through cascaded impact ionization is the conductivity in that little gap is going up by about a factor of 1 billion. So, there's, so of course, it's not a very good split ring resonator anymore at that point because there's quite a lot of conduction. Instead of the electrons doing this, they're doing this. Right? They don't care very much that there's a gap there. Right? So the resonance gets spoiled. And this is pretty easy to model. So it's pretty easy to tell about how much the conductivity has changed. That's enough, in fact, that we can just wire the thing up to a scope. So this is one of these dipole antennas. It's just two little pieces of gold like this. And now the other ends are wired up to pads that we could, could use to make measure, electrical measurements. Each time a terahertz pulse comes in, you can just measure the current that it produces. Right? Because, of course, the, the conductivity in this little gap is getting to be pretty decent. Right? Actually, this is not a bad terahertz sensor. At, at larger terahertz input fields, we'll actually see dielectric breakdown inside that gap. OK, so let's do something a little more interesting along these lines. Now we're looking at a correlated electron material. So it's not gallium arsenide. It's vanadium dioxide. It has an insulator to metal phase transition. And at room temperature, it has a distortion away from a higher symmetry phase. And, and associated with that is a splitting of electronic energy levels. There may not be many chemists in the audience. Chemists know this sort of thing as the Jan Teller effect. But physics people know it. And, and certainly it's appropriate here as the Pyle's distortion. So what's happening is because of coupling between the phonons, that is this distortion of, along one of the vibrational coordinates and the electron energy levels, the, the lowering of the symmetry splits these energy levels, these, these, um, these bands, so that instead of having being a metal, suddenly the, a gap opens up and you have an insulator. Right? So there's a huge change in conductivity. And that happens going from here to here at about 345 or, or so Kelvin. This has been studied at some length, so with optical excitation, you see the sort of 100 picosecond or so time scale. That almost surely has to do with making lots of carriers and then and going from, from insulator to metal and then seeing gradual domain growth on a fairly slow time scale. So here's a sample where we put an array of these split ring resonators on the surface. But, but we didn't yet come in with a 
terahertz pumping pulse, we just raise the temperature. So this has a resonance at 0.4 terahertz. And as we raise the temperature, it completely disappears if we go above the phase transition temperature. And that's because you really don't have a split resonator at all. You have a glob of metal on top of another glob of metal, and there's absolutely no insulation here. Right? So there's no, no resonance, no gap at all. Right? And here's what happens if we don't raise the ambient temperature, but we just come in with increasingly strong terahertz fields. Almost exactly the same thing, almost complete disappearance of that resonance, because now the terahertz field inside that gap is producing carriers, accelerating them, they're doing impact ionization, we're <laughs> undergoing the phase transition, and now we have a glob of metal on top of another glob of metal, and there's no resonance anymore. Right? So that's what we're seeing. Now we can time resolve that, so all the information we need is really here, this is 0.8 terahertz, and you, what you see is that that, that resonance drops almost immediately. Right. In other words, basically, by the time the terahertz field is over inside the gap, we've undergone the electronic phase transition from insulator to metal. Right. And this is not too hard to model. We think the excitation mechanism is basically pool frankel ionization. That, it, that is, we're liberating carriers. But then once liberated, we're accelerating carriers. They then do impact ionization and so forth. By the way, in this case, we can also turn up the field and get breakdown, but you can see it's different. This, this is along equal potential lines. What I showed you before was along field lines. Right? Now, what I've shown you so far is a terahertz-induced electronic phase transition. But there's, there's a structural phase transition associated with this, right? There's this distortion, a change in the crystal symmetry. Our measurement, though, it, uh, it, using terahertz, or for that matter, optical probe pulses, doesn't directly reveal that. But of course, nowadays, we can go to places like the, the LCLS and, at SLAC, where there's a femtosecond hard X-ray pulses. And we can do X-ray diffraction to probe directly off of the crystal lattice and watch to see if the phase transition is happening. Right? So it's just a remarkable capability. So we made a structure that's compatible with that. It's not split ring resonators. It's just gold strips with micron gaps, but again, for a terahertz field polarized this way, there's a capacitive gap there, and there's field enhancement. Okay, here is just um, X-ray diffraction at different temperatures um, off of this, just to see that we can see the difference between them when we look at, the, at a selected spot. So these are the two different phases. These, this is a rocking curve. And here's the time-dependent data. And what you see is there's this diminishment of the initial phase and growth in of the new phase. But there's also a lag <coughs> of about 10 picoseconds before anything gets going. Right? Let me blow that up a little bit here. And, and so what you can see is the electronic phase transition happens completely before the crystal lattice tr phase transition, the structural phase transition, really even gets underway. Right? That isn't obvious, right? It's not so clear. After all, it's a little easy to, it's easy to imagine, well, the electrons are, are following the nuclei. Right? But it actually isn't true. The, you can completely change the conductivity and enter the new phase long before the lattice lagging behind eventually catches up. The long time part, again, is domain growth. But the point is that even on short time scales, there's a lag that's clearly longer than the time needed for the electronic change to occur. Okay. So I'll just mention a couple of other highly nonlinear terahertz-induced electronic responses. These are organic crystals that we've grown right into these gaps. And the terahertz field is polarized this way. So nothing happens in these gaps, but there's field enhancement here. And you can see there's chemical decomposition that's happened here. Here, the material has completely disappeared. Right? And in fact, if we do this near a little, a little matted piece that, that gathers up the, the stuff from the gas phase, and then we take that over to a Raman spectrometer and do surface enhanced Raman scattering, we can see all kinds of molecular fragments. And what has happened, I, I believe, is that basically we've liberated electrons. These are organic crystals. They have all sorts of lightly trapped electrons at interfaces and defects and everywhere. I believe what's happening is we're liberating them and accelerating them. And as soon as you have EV electrons crashing into molecules, you're going to break bonds. Right? So you're breaking bonds. This is gradual. We turned on the field and went and got some coffee and came back. 
and saw what, what had happened after many, many shots. So gradually, there's decomposition. We actually believe that it may be possible to, to, to change that, to have, have very, very quick, quick decomposition, but this was gradual. So to probe this a little bit further, we instead looked at materials that luminesce. So these are electroluminescent materials, and we've grown them into these, these gaps. Right? So I've drawn in, the reason it's this, got this pattern is because all of these are inside these gaps. You can see that because I've drawn in some of the split ring resonators here. So this is with an organic electroluminescent material. In other words, terrors light is coming in and it's in, what it's doing is, is, is doing charge separation and there's recombination that luminesces. This is something, essentially the same thing with quantum dots, core shell quantum dots. So now again, we've got strips with micron gaps in between them. And you can see quite strong luminescence. You can actually see this in a, in a, in a room without all the lights off. Um, and here's a close-up of one gap. And, and actually, this is where the field is strongest. It's not actually strongest right in the middle. It's more like fringe fields. So you see strong fields all around here. And you can see this luminescence pouring out from terahertz excitation. And all that's happen, happening here, we've actually oxide-coated the, the gold strips. So we're not doing terahertz-induced field emission of electrons from the gold. The terahertz field is strong enough to just pull electrons off of one quantum dot right onto its neighbor, and then you get radiative recombination and emission. Okay. And this is a threshold process, and we think we understand the behavior leading up to and then after the threshold. And I just want to finish this topic by showing you what happens if we turn down the field a little bit. It's still fairly strong inside these gaps. It's on the order of megavolts per centimeter. Turn it down a bit just below the threshold. Here's what happens. So, of course, these, these materials aren't just electroluminescent. They're, they're photoluminescent. If I bring in light at the band gap, I can excite them. In this case, it's at 2 eV. And they'll, they'll luminesce. They'll, they'll emit. And if I bring in light that's below the band gap, nothing happens unless the terahertz field is also in there at the same time. And then what happens is, depending on how strong the incident terahertz field is, it's, our incident field is, is only up to 100 kilovolts per centimeter. Remember, I'm keeping it below threshold. The enhanced field is, is, is about five times stronger than that. And so here is the spectrum of tunable light that we used to, to induce photoluminescence. And what this is showing is as we bring in stronger and stronger terahertz fields, we can bring in light well below the band gap and still see photoluminescence. And when I say well below the band gap, the band gap's 2 eV. This is 1.4 eV. So the, the band gap, the absorption edge, has moved right across the visible spectrum. Right? And it follows the terahertz field. It's only, that only happens while the terahertz field is in there. We can follow the lobes of the field. With this. So this is an unbelievably fast and strong electro-optic effect right, in both the real and imaginary parts of the refractive index. But it's also just interesting, you know, what's happening is really crudely you could say this, right? It's quantum confined Stark effect. I've got electronic levels and it's doing this and the band gap is getting lower. That's really a sort of low order perturbation view of things. In quantum dots really you have fine structure. There are multiple electronic levels. And these fields are mixing them all. So a colleague of mine, a theoretical colleague, Adam Willard and his group, have actually done good quality calculations and, and that, that confirm it, what happens and show us the, the mixing among states that brings about these really large shifts in the, in the band gap. OK. OK. So let's talk about the dipoles. So, so now we're going to move nuclei around, not electrons. Then you have to work a little bit harder because nuclei are more massive. But in fact, there's an awful lot that can be done. So this is going to be rotations, right? And if you remember back to when you learned about the quantum mechanics of rotations of molecules in air, the remember J times J plus 1, right? The energy levels get bigger as, J go, as the quantum number goes up. And the difference between transitions increases linearly. That is, the lowest transition from J equals 0 to 1 is this. Let's say, let's just say it's. 2b, and, and the next one is going to be 4b and 6b and 8b. That is, all the transition frequencies are integer multiples of the lowest frequency. Okay? That's all you got to know. 
Now our pulse comes in, our turret's pulse, and we're at room temperature, so lots of these rotational states are, are populated. And it's going to drive coherences of all of them. So the lowest frequency one is going to rotate slowly, it's going to go around slowly, and they'll increase and increase. But so they'll, they'll go out of phase very quickly, but they'll rephase because they're all integer multiples. So each, each time the lowest one goes around once, this will go around twice, three times, and so forth. And this is well known. These are what are called revivals, rotational revivals. So to first order, even with a weak field, like I said, this was well known, and it's been uh, an analog of it has been done with optical excitation. You can see that if the, when the initial pulse comes in, for, an, for a short period of time, you've got some net orientational alignment of the dipoles. This is an OCS, it's a pop polar molecule. So, so there's a, a, an alignment, but since they all rotate at different frequencies, that goes out of phase almost immediately. So it's very short-lived, but it comes back. There's a revival, one full turn of the lowest frequency later, because for a moment, there's a net orientational ordering of the molecules again. And then they're going to go out of phase, but again, they'll come back and so forth. So you see these revivals. And again, that's just one field interaction. It doesn't require a strong field. This is the free induction decay, right? The, this is a succession of terahertz little pulses is coming out of the material. Right? Here's a better view of it of, with better signal to noise. So here's a number of these bursts of terahertz radiation. And if we Fourier transform that, we get the rotational spectrum. It's all these lines that are evenly spaced. Good way to make a, a frequency comb, by the way, in the terahertz part of the spectrum. So that's with one field interaction. But let's now make the field a little bit stronger so it interacts more strongly. Now you have two successive interactions. The first one made a coherence. The second one makes population, and also two quantum coherences. <laughs> That is, the coherence is a coherent superposition of wave functions j and j plus 1. That's the first order coherence. The, then with the second pulse, we can have a superposition, of, a, a, a coherent superposition of three wave functions, j, j plus 1, and j plus 2. That means there's a coherence between j and j plus 2, a two quantum coherence, as well as the one quantum ones. And there's population. And they both show up in optical birefringence measurements. So now I'm not measuring a terahertz field coming out. I'm measuring a net alignment of molecules which produces birefringence. Then optically, this polarization is different from this one. And so I see a steady state signal because there's population. And I see these recurrences, which are actually at twice the revival frequency. This is the two quantum coherence. Okay? And I'll just mention, Interestingly, if you look at this population, of course it decays. There are collisions and so forth. So the rotational energy we're putting into the molecules will return while we get back to my equilibrium distribution. But if I look closely, I actually see a little jog in that when the revival happens. Right? Here's why that's happening. It's actually super radiance. That is, don't forget, remember a terahertz burst left the sample right here. Normally, that's a field that's pretty weak, and we don't consider its energy. But in this case, it's not that weak. It contains a measurable amount of energy. Where did that come from? It has to come from the energy we put into those rotational populations. So you see a little jump down in the populations when that happens. And after one more revival, it will happen again, and so forth. And it is emission from the collective dipole. It really is super radiance, although, of course, normally, in most cases, super radiance is something that builds up from noise, right? So you, you wouldn't be able to predict the precise time of emission or the precise phase, right? Here, this is scientifically what's referred to as super duper radiance because, because we know the phase, right? We, we know the phase, we know exactly when it's gonna come out, right? But it actually really is the same type of phenomenon. Okay, one more little kind of curious detail so let's take two pulses, two terahertz pulses, and separate them in time. And each one of them is going to make signal that looks like that, right? Or, or like that, let's say, the simplest example. So now I'm just going to squish that data down. So here's the first pulse as it arrives. This is, that, this is the population signal that looks like something bigger before, and then it decays. But I've, I've suppressed it way down here. Here is the two quantum coherence, the little spike. It, well, it was a big spike, but again, I've pushed it all down. And here's the second pulse, and it arrives, so here's its population, and, and here's its two quantum coherence. But what's this? This huge pulse 
that's the two quantum coherence. When I have the first pulse making one field interaction and the second pulse later making a second field interaction, the two quantum coherence is much bigger if I time the two field interactions properly because then the phasing works better. The second field comes and interacts right at the right time when I've maximized the coherences such that the two quantum out outcome is biggest. And actually, because of this simple relationship where all the coherences are integer multiples of the lowest one, actually, it's very simple to do that. I'll, even with just this one control parameter, I'm doing very simple coherent control over a few dozen coherent states right? and getting them all to phase up in this simple way. If I vary the time between those pulses, you can see there's an optimum. So this is one pulse coming in, and then this is data with the second pulse coming in at different times after. And this is the, that big pulse, its biggest at a particular delay time, and so forth. So there's an optimum. I can display that data as a 2D spectrum with two time delays, right? One is the time between the pulses. The other is the measurement time after that. So this is a simple kind of 2D spectroscopy. What's now become called 2D terahertz, terahertz, Raman, two terahertz field interactions, and then the optical measurement. The optical measurement, I called it by refringence. Really, it's a Raman process. That is, the optical transition has delta J equals 2, and that's what gives us that, that signal. OK, but let's keep going. Let's go to three field interactions. So how, here are two pulses, one and two. And this time delay is not related to the, the revival time or anything. It's a sort of random choice. And this is a photon echo. So one, two, out comes our echo. That's coming. At, we're still in a fairly low order perturbative limit. That, that's coming because of three field interactions. The two pulses came in and made a population, and the third, third pulse made a new coherence, which rephased from the first one. There's our echo. Right? And we can, of course, we can see that much better, too, if we, if we optimize the, the display of it. These are the echo signals with different delays between the two pulses. And we Fourier transform it and get that same spectrum back. But this is not the first order one field interaction Fourier transform. This is a Fourier transform of that time-dependent signal showing all of the rotational contributions to the echo. And if I Fourier transform the other dimension, the time between the pulses, I've got a 2D rotational spectrum that's fully resolved rotationally. And that's interesting because what that says is, of course, we have our diagonal terms where you know we went up j to j plus 1, j plus 1 again, and then back to j and made signal. But we can also go to j plus 2 and have an off-diagonal term. And then with additional field interactions, we can go way off the diagonal. So in fact, you see really quite high order terms there. And that's because you have, you have successive field interactions that are producing quite high, high order responses. And you have all the signal contributions you expect, the photon echo or rephasing signal, non-rephasing signals, two quantum signals. For those of you familiar with these kinds of spectra, all of the contributions that you would expect are appearing. Right? I think there's a lot of power in that because, of course, by looking at these different spots as a function of time, it should become possible to follow individual j to j prime or even m to m prime, that is evolution of population or coherences from individual states to other individual states. Right? So I think a whole set of possibilities emerges um, with, with this sort of capability. OK, I'll just touch on the fact that we can also drive polarizabilities to make the molecules rotate. That's well known from optics. So they're op you can use femtosecond optical pulses <coughs> through Raman scattering, stimulated Raman scattering, and, and it'll exert a, an impulse torque on molecules, and they'll rotate. But I didn't imagine that the terahertz pulses would also do that. They do. So this is air. So these are two nonpolar molecules. And you still see lots of signals. Right? This is, again, a measurement of optical birefringence, but it's driven by the, the terahertz pumping pulse. And if you Fourier transform it, you see all of these two quant. You know, the, remember, delta J is two for optical transitions. You see a whole, all this set of well, well defined and easily assignable transitions for oxygen and nitrogen. We've seen the same sort of thing in liquids. I, I expected in liquids we'd be dominated by dipolar interactions, but it's not really the case. It's mostly, um, it's mostly polarizabilities. In other words, just like an optical pulse, our teric field will torque molecules and make them rotate. And again, this is probed optically. 
Um, there's some more recent work by this. This is from the group of Jeff Blake at Caltech, where he's really exploited this to look at both in, intermolecular motion of this sort and also low frequency molecular vibrations in another variation of this, of this 2D Teres, Teres Raman spectroscopy. OK, I'm going to finish by talking about driving the spins. How am I doing? Oh, good. OK. So, so I promise to stay completely on the rails for at least five of that. So let's talk about the spins. Our Tarot's fields come along with magnetic fields, <coughs> and those can drive, mag drive spin transitions. So here's an illustration of the two um, low-frequency magnon modes in yttrium orthoferrite. That is, it's, a, it's a, what's called a canted anti-ferromagnetic crystal. It, it, it would want to be exactly anti-ferromagnetic, but in fact, there's an interaction that makes the two moments go a little off the axis. So there's a net magnetic moment. And because of that, now there are, there are magnetic, uh, there are magnon modes, collective spin modes. And in one case, if we have the polarization of the magnetic field in that same direction, it just drives amplitude vary oscillations of the moment. And if it's polarized in the plane perpendicular, then it drives precession of the net spins around the original axis. And the linear response is exactly what you'd expect. These are just free induction decays with the two different polarizations. So this is just linear spectroscopy giving us the magnon frequencies. But now let's take two pulses and variably delay them, just like before with the rotations. Look at echoes and other signals, Fourier transform, and then we have 2D spectra of the magnons, right? And this is, these are the two different modes. And all, again, all of the signal contributions are present. So that's interesting because what it means is we can drive the magnetic moment nonlinearly. We're still in the low order perturbative regime here, but certainly nonlinear enough to measure these third order signals. Um, and so we're now starting to look at, si at, at samples where there's coupling between ma magnetic modes. And you know, in 2D spectra like this, these are all diagonal contributions, but the off-diagonal peaks tell you about coupling between the different modes, and that's what we're starting to look at. The other thing that we're trying to do is can we, can we be out of, can we move out of the low order perturbative limit? You know, can I drive spins hard enough to flip them, right? Well, I don't know, but we think that it's possible. And uh, you know, I have, I'm, I'm in a chemistry department, so I have magnetic resonance colleagues. They, they have pi pulses and flip spins all the time. Right? But nothing much happens, right? If you're a proton and the spin flips, well, OK, life goes on. Nothing much has changed. But if you're an antiferromagnetic crystal and the net magnetic moment flips, it stays that way. There's nothing to bring it back, right? We should be able to switch magnetic moments on, the, the, in, in a sense, the, their own natural time scale, right? So we aren't yet able to do that, but I'm hopeful that we, we will be able to, to leave the regime of, 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 of sort of weak nonlinearities. Um, but in the meantime, even in linear response, it turns out there's a huge amount that's worth measuring. So now I'm going to be a chemist for just a minute and measure the spin transition in transition metal high spin compounds. You know, I've got iron, I've got other high spin, uh, other transition metals that can have high spin states. And the, the magnetic sublevels, many of those can be in the terahertz frequency range. And those have been awkward. They've been measured before, to be sure, but in much more difficult ways. Here, we measure these free induction decays. The, the data collection times on these can be seconds. And we come out with an electron paramagnetic resonance spectrum, an EPR spectrum in the terahertz frequency range that gives us these zero field splittings. There's not an applied magnetic field here, but there's still a splitting. Right? And we can measure that in a very, very facile way. So in fact, now we've really developed this as a, as a real spectroscopy um, that, that real, real chemists are, are now starting to use. We, even this was collaborative with one of my inorganic colleagues who does ma molecular magnets. And there are many, many reasons to measure these. It, because, because these zero field splittings are extremely sensitive to local molecular geometries, symmetries, and electronic structures. So there's lots of incentive to characterize them um, in, in all sorts of materials, in, in small molecules like the ones we've studied here, but also in proteins, things like this. So, so what we're trying to do now is extend those nonlinear measurements to do 2D spectroscopy, 2D magnetic resonance of these systems. One of the reasons I want to do that is because 
it would be really useful to make these sorts of measurements in proteins. Right? You know, I'd like to look at hemoglobin and maybe glycated hemoglobin that's a form that's common if, if you have diabetes and distinguish between them. I can't do it right now. That's because the protein has all these low frequency polar floppy modes that are at terahertz frequencies and they have much stronger transition dipoles than these puny spin transitions. So what I really see then is I see just this broad structureless spectrum of low frequency floppy vibrations. But if I can do photon echoes, spin echoes, those floppy modes are going to, you know, they, they don't stay in phase very long. I think they'll go out of phase very quickly, but the spins have reasonably long dephasing times. So then the only thing that should be left is the spins. So I'm hopeful that in very complicated molecules, where normally the spin transitions are obscured, I'll be able to see those. And if I can do that and do the 2D spectroscopy, well, in multinuclear compounds, or, you know, with more than one transition metal, we should see the spin-spin coupling all, and, and so forth. It would be very revealing. OK, so, so I've, I think I've been very good about staying on the rails, but I, I'm obligated to demonstrate that we're not obli completely obliged to do so. So remember I showed this, you know, this waveguide phonon polariton stuff. Now let's build on those magnon studies. Let's take one of our, our antiferromagnetic crystals, this one's erbium orthoferrite, and just make a, a hybrid waveguide. It's lithium niobate and it's erbium orthoferrite. And it, they're just thrown together. There's no fabrication here, right? So I've got phonons in one and magnons in the other. And the, the electric field is in the plane of the lithium niobate, driving the phonons. And the magnetic field is this way in the plane of the erbium orthoferrite driving one of the magnon nodes. So now they're all coupled, and I've got magnon phonon polaritons. And if I do it, if I excite the terrace waves and let it go in there and just make the measurements of the waves, I can do the dispersion thing again. I can just determine everything. So here's the lithium niobate again. This is what I showed you before. Here's the hybrid waveguide. Looks kind of similar, but, but, but what's that? What's going on there? Let's take a closer look. It's, it's a Rabi splitting is what it is. Here are my, my, my magnon mode is not dispersive. My phonon polariton mode is basically linear. It's light-like here. And there's an avoided crossing between the two. Right? And it's very easy to measure. Right? And the splitting is such that actually this is in the strong coupling regime. No fabrication. In fact, to fit the data, we had to assume eight microns of air because of little dust particles between the two things. That's how sophisticated the fabrication was. Right? And yet, already the coupling is, is in the strong coupling regime. We can also make those cavities that I just showed you before. right? And now, again, we can put a defect in there. And so now it's, not a, now it's a cavity mode in, resonant, in this resonant cavity. And the exact same thing happens. So here, we don't have wave vector to play around with in the cavity. But if we change the temperature, both the phonon mode and the magnon mode are temperature dependent. And we see an avoided crossing between them. And it's fitted in exactly the same way. And it's comparable in magnitude. So I mean, again, you have Rabi splitting. You have, you have Rabi flopping of energy back and forth between the, the modes. Right? So what you have is a really facile way with, of, of doing uh, you know, a, a spin manipulation. And in my dreams, we'll be able to both flip spins and also transmit the spin information this way coherently. Right? These move across millimeters. It's really, you know, the, there's very little loss, unlike if you want to move polarized electrons around. Right? And there's one last thing we're trying to do. So Bose-Einstein condensation of magnons has been demonstrated. And if you work out the, the effective mass of magnon phonon polaritons, just like exciton polaritons, but even more, the effective mass is almost zero because the photo photons are really light. Right? And in these cavities that you can make, the effective mass is on the order of 10 to the minus 7 times the electron mass. That means the de Broglier wavelength at room temperature is about 10 microns. Okay? That means that these quasi-particles are you know, throwing baseballs at each other. Right? After all, and, and at low temperature, it's about 50 microns. Right? You can almost see that by eye. What that means is that's the threshold excitation density at which you should get to the condensate. Really low, right? So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to make condensates of these at, even at room temperature, 
right, with all sorts of interesting properties. And unlike our exciton polariton condensates, I, there's a limit to how hard I can pump those. Because, spoiler alert, excitons are really two real particles. There's an electron and a hole. And if I pump like crazy, they split up into electrons and holes and forget that they're excitons. There's a binding energy, and when there are zillions of them, they, they no longer stay bound. That's not true for magnons, right? Or phonons, right? They're not really two, they're not two real particles bound together, right? They are quasi-particles, if, 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 which we often refer to them that way, and it's reasonable, <laughs> but they aren't pairs of real particles. And that's why, of course, there's no binding energy associated with them. So I can keep pumping them. And I think we should be able to pump hard enough to either switch or substantially modulate magnetic moments and degrees of freedom coupled to them. And if we can do that in the form of the condensate, we will have a really new state of matter that has some really interesting dynamical properties. OK, I promised, like I warned you, I was going to just at least do one thing that's a little bit off the rails. But I actually think that we're going to at least be in a position to test that very soon. Um, so let me just try to summarize. I've talked about different kinds of interactions between Tarek's field and matter. And really, what I want to sort of end with is the, the fact that it, it's increasingly possible to gain access to these degrees of freedom and even drive them fairly far. So, so moderate nonlinearities are already quite routinely achievable. And in some cases, we can drive really very highly nonlinear responses, in, including things like phase transitions, electroluminescence, chemical reactions, and other things. And I'm hopeful for another whole set of interesting nonlinear responses that I, I believe we'll be able to drive and, and learn more from. Uh, so let me put up the people who've really done all of this work. Um, these are the, really the ones who have, have made everything possible and, and made all the real measurements. And let me thank you for your attention. So I have one comment and one question. So the comment is, during your presentation, you, uh, you exemplify that one is uh, the coupling between photon and, and quantum is omnipresent. It's always there. This morning, I heard from Eugene Arthur that the past and the present are photons <laughs> and the future is quantum. Therefore, I would like to propose a theorem <laughs> that the past, present, and future is photonics, long live photonics. <laughs> My question, you, 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 you showed some results on the huge terahertz induced quantum confined Stark effect. Have you done any time result photoluminescence of that data? Because we we did. So, so when we measure the, in other words, of, of course, we, we did two things. One is we measured, does it happen at all if the optical pulse moves away in time from the terahertz pulse, and the answer is no. Right? So, so in that respect, we time resolve that. But then we just looked at the luminescence that comes out and says, OK, what are the dynamics? And they're still not very fast. right? They're ordinary luminescence dynamics, but not the same. And, and I suspect it's due to kind of mundane reasons. You know, We've moved charges around. So in other words, the luminescing collection of dots isn't quite the same as the collection of dots that ordinarily is doing photoluminescence. And I think that that's the whole reason. I'm not sure. We're now going down to single quantum dot imaging, right? And we see effects on blinking. And, and I'm not being coy. If I knew more about that than what I just said, I would tell you. But, but, but we see effects. And I, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's because of similar causes. I don't, we know too little at this point to know, but, but at least there are clearly effects. Yeah. So, um, a technical question regarding the terahertz, terahertz uh, 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 photoresistor, which is the yeah. detector that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, uh, how much noise you have, and how, how much is the quantum efficiency yeah, in yeah, terms it, of working at a single photon regime? Yeah, so far, still pretty terrible. So we can, so I, I, we actually have some of the numbers. I can't give them to you by memory, other than to say the sensitivity is a few kilovolts per centimeter. That's not really good enough as for a great detector. It's fine for us, actually. It's pretty handy. But it's not, it's not what you would want for a real sensitivity. But we haven't done anything to optimize that. Right? So I think there, there would be lots of ways to vastly improve that. And, and we're hoping to do some of that. You remember this paper that John Doyle and Melanie Schnell had, where they looked at the three-dimensional orientation of molecule by looking at not just the frequency, but the phase of the uh, free induction decay of, of a uh, uh, isolated gas phase molecule. So uh, turning that around, um, 
you could, with your fields and cross polarizations and controlling the phase between two terahertz fields, you could uh, three-dimensionally orient Absolutely. molecules. And there's a lot of interest in three-dimensional orientation for all kinds of reasons. Sure. No, I, I know. And, and Charlie Fleischer, who in the group started us along this path, is doing some of that. And there, there is a tremendous amount more that we should be doing. Because not, of course, as you know, once you even have some degree of net orientation, an optical pulse will improve that. So, the, so all of the orienting doesn't even need to be done at, with terahertz pulses. So you know, there are, um, there's a huge range of possibilities exploiting different polarization directions and so forth. Sure. Okay, please join me.